Ladies and gentlemen, our program will begin in just a moment. Ladies and gentlemen, our program will begin in a moment. Good day. Welcome to Advocacy Anywhere, powered by AJC. Advocacy Anywhere is AJC's digital platform that enables you to engage with AJC's global expertise, content, and advocacy from wherever you are. Today's program is brought to you in partnership with Jewish Insider. You can sign up for Jewish Insider's daily kickoff by visiting www.jewishinsider.com. We are delighted to be joined today by Congressman Don Beyer of Virginia and Congressman Pete Olson of Texas for a bipartisan conversation on the No Hate Act, a bill they introduced in the House of Representatives that incentivizes hate crime reporting. Bipartisan support for the bill's passage has been the signature advocacy issue of the Muslim Jewish Advisory Council a domestically focused advocacy coalition co-convened by AJC with the Islamic Society of North America. Moderating today's conversation will be Julie Raymond, AJC's Deputy Director for Policy and Diplomatic Affairs. After we hear from Julie and our esteemed guests, we will take your questions. You may email your question to questions at AJC.org, questions is plural, or use the Q&A chat feature in Zoom. Julie, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Julian. And I'm so pleased to be joined by Congressman Beyer now. And Congressman Olson will be joining us momentarily um, for this conversation about the No Hate Act. As it was mentioned previously, this has been a key legislative priority, not just for AJC, but also for our Muslim Jewish Advisory Council and for others. In addition to, to those efforts, we've mobilized our friends in Asian American organizations to write to Congress to garner support. Our, La our Latino Jewish Leadership Council issued a statement supporting the bill, and AJC urged both the Congressional Caucus on Black Jewish Relations and the Problem Solvers Caucus to endorse the bill. Our friends and supporters around the country have identified coalition partners, written letters, had meetings with members of Congress, and now they have the chance to hear from the members of Congress, the driving forces, about why the No Hate Act is so important and what we need to do to get it over the finish line. So thank you for your leadership and thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Julie. It, it's, a, it's a real honor and I really look forward to the conversation. And it has been um, one of the highlights of my congressional career to be able to work together with Pete Olson to get this passed by, by the House in, in a good bipartisan fashion. Can you tell us a little bit about what prompted you to first introduce this legislation in 2016? And while well, you've already alluded to it um, in that statement, but can you tell us a little bit about what's different now in this congressional session? Well, the thing that really focused it is during the, the presidential campaign of 2016, when candidate Trump came out with his uh, Muslim ban, um, right away within a couple of days, there was a, a major hate crime incident at a mosque in the district that I represent in Northern Virginia. And then within two weeks, there was another hate crime incident at a synagogue uh, in Northern Virginia. Um, and, you know, I, I went out to do, you know, re regrets and show solidarity with both communities. And it was then that I realized, um, and I'm not quite sure who brought it to my attention, that some significant number of the police departments law enforcement agencies around the country don't report any hate crimes at all. Uh, I, I've been in business for 45 years, first with my dad, then with my sister and brother. And you know, we've always tried to be driven by data. You know, what is, what are the statistics tell us? You know, I'm really good at reading a financial statement <laughs> because you have to be to survive. And so if you look, if you want to be driven by data and what the facts are, you look and say, um, we don't have any data the whole whole notion that you can't manage what you don't measure. So initially in the 115th Congress, the last one, the bill we put together imposed penalties on the police departments that didn't report. Um, it was tough to get that through. They didn't want to do the, the carrot thing. So this time in this Congress, we changed it to, or we got rid of the stick and put in carrots, uh, three specific carrots um, of money, federal money to encourage people to participate. And uh, I, I, we can go through the details if you want, but the, the hope is that 
Well, right now, 87% of police departments don't report any hate crimes. Only 13% reported one or more last year that we can have. And that's, it'd be great if that were true. But on the other hand, we, there were more hate crime deaths last year than I think in, in history because of the Tree of Life massacre. Um, and by the way, um, it's, it's great to have Pete join us. Something like 60% of the hate crimes that are based on, on religion, on faith, are against Jews in America. Pete, welcome. Yeah. Sorry, welcome. technical difficult guys, real problems. A computer science major from Rice University killed by getting on the Zoom. So I'm sorry I'm late, but glad I'm be here. And how about Don Beyer? He grabbed this bull by the horns, my friends. It's way overdue. We know the hate crimes, as Don mentioned, are unreported every single day. And this bill does nothing radical. It just says, please report these hate crimes as hate crimes. Make sure law enforcement are trained for a hate crime, whole different investigation, okay? Just note the black and white investigation, take some time, get some input, get some evidence, so we put these people in jail. It also gives a little authorization of funding because they need some funding. As Don mentioned, hate crimes happen in America every single day. And I live in the most prosperous county in Texas, Fort Bend County. Think with all that wealth and education, no hate crimes. Not a Jewish crime, but a black church, historic black church was arsoned, firebombed about seven years ago because no one knows why. They're assuming it's because they were a black church. That's a hate crime. What's reported as a hate crime? We all know it is. And thanks to AGC and our good friend, you guys got out there big time and helped us get a little press conference going in front of the firebomb church that hasn't been repaired for over seven years. So Randy Zarlinski, thank you, thank you, thank you as well. Julie, You're one of the things that Pete, Pete mm -hmm. mentioned is that we can have done this without all of the calls, letters, and and face-to-face -face lobbying that AJC did. You know, you, you, you it's, people will respond to Pete and to me, but they really like it when their constituents call them and say, "This is a good bill. Look at it." Thank you. Thank with, you. The, with Dodd's effort, too, guys, you got that bill attached to a bill that wouldn't pass. But the point is, it's passed the House. It's not controversial. Democrats and Republicans support this bill. We just have to find that mechanism. Maybe if we do some stimulus package for COVID, something coming up, National Defense Authorization Bill, we'll keep our eyes open. Don are committed to make sure this bill is passed in this Congress, not the 117th, the 116th. Now, now, now. We're committed to, Congressman Olson, I wanna ask you a question about that. Thanks to your leadership in the House, the No Hate Act, has really strong bipartisan support with even numbers of Democrats and Republicans. In the Senate, the numbers are a little different and it's supported exclusively by Democrats. What do you think is preventing the senators from your party to sign on as co-sponsors? As you said, this is a bipartisan issue. It should be a bipartisan issue. I can't speak for the Senate because they're a little, <laughs> their rules are a little different than ours. Uh, but I'll keep raises with John Cord and Ted Cruz, two Texans. I mean, they're my close friends. And also having worked there for a couple of years on the Senate side and the House side, I've got former colleagues like Tim Scott, like Cory Gardner, who have served with me, like uh, Martha McSally, who've been House members with me. I'll call them up and say, guys, no brainer. Put this out, it's a slam dunk. And listen, as Don knows, being the former Lieutenant Governor of Virginia, these words are very rare in DC these days. By partisan, by camel. The same exact bill is in the House and the Senate. So that gives a great chance to pass with the election coming up in November. I'll talk to the two senators I know, all the senators, and say, guys, just step up. Once you get this landslide going, it's going to go. And for somebody like Senator McSally, who's in a tough race. Um, you know, supporting a bill that has broad political acceptance where, you know, if you talk to anybody on the street, they'd say, this makes sense. Uh, this would be a good idea for her. When we've been talking to, to members of Congress, frankly, in, in the House and the Senate, uh, urging their support, we've heard some reasons, right? So we hear crime is crime and it should be punished and prosecuted as such. It doesn't matter what the animus is. 
We've even heard that if communities publish their hate crimes records, it might deter tourism or business development. How would you respond to those rebuttals? Congressman Olson, I'll, I'll ask you first. Well, I've heard that too. Base, I've heard some cities here say, if we report a hate crime, our town gets tagged with the term a town of hate. And I'm sorry, the fact happened, this happened in your town and your county. That means you should step up to the plate and lead, not cower and lead. You'll score more points in elections, whatever, if you stand up and say, this happened here, we learned from this, we're making adjustments, this will never ever happen again. And that's my message. It happened here in Fort Bend County. It happens all the time here, things we don't know about because again, there's encouragement not to report these things. With Don's effort on this bill, we stopped that. You are rewarded, encouraged to report these crimes. Though, by the way, this is not just a normal, as I mentioned, assault. This is assault based on hate. There's much more evidence that is required to get the big conviction. That's what's deserved. This is not just, this hits the fabric of our country. Our individual rights to freedom, our, our freedom of religion, association, whatever. And again, it's a simple message. I just hope the Senate has done said, hey guys, maybe a tough election. Martha McSally, Cory Gardner, Colorado's kind of tough there. Cory, maybe support hate crimes might get you some little support back home. I don't care how they do it. I just want it done. Congressman Byron, is there anything you would want to add? Sure, just, just to add to, to Pete's really thoughtful response. I've discovered uh, again and again in my, my life that uh, being honest, authentic, transparent from the beginning is almost always the best way to get through something that might be embarrassing. Mm -hmm. uh, my dad always used to say, first loss is best loss. You got to take a hit, just take the hit and move on. Um, and it, it doesn't get better with time. I've also, you know, I've, as Pete knows, I've been a car dealer for a long time. So as many times we've screwed up somebody's car, right? You know, more than once the wheel has fallen off on the way home. And I found that the best way to deal with it is to apologize, is to acknowledge it and say, I'm sorry, we, we made a mistake. Same, same in politics, you know, I, I've certainly made mistakes in my political life, you know, taking the wrong position that I later have to apologize for, that's okay. But the other deal, as Pete says, is when you identify where there is a hate crime, there's also resources in this bill to go do the training and the community engagement and the public relations that can help heal those communities and make them better than they were before. And one thing, thank you to the AGC and Randy Zerlinski, because our local police, or my home police department, Sugar Texas, was not on board this bill. We approached them with it about a year ago. They sort of blew us off. Y'all got in their face, talked to the chief, African American. He saw that and said, this is no, a no-brainer. We're all in. That's how we win this thing, one step at a time. Like Don said, being honest, just look people right in the eye. Here's where I'm coming from. What are your concerns? I want to sort of stay on that point for a minute. And uh, Congressman Byer also talked about sort of the numbers. You talked about he's an African-American um, law enforcement chief, and uh, you talked about the African-American church. And the reality is that Blacks and Jews make up the vast majority of hate crimes victims. Um, I think in 2018, 47% of racially motiv motivated hate crimes were against Blacks. Um, nearly 60% of religiously motivated hate crimes were against Jews. With Jews, it's especially complicated, right? Because anti-Semitism can stem from multiple sources, either from white supremacy or those who would target Jews or Jewish institutions out of animus towards Israel. Of course, this is where law enforcement training comes in, like that which is in the No Hate Act. But, and I'll ask this of Congressman Byer, what else can be done to address specifically rising anti-Semitism in the United States? And do you think that criticism of Israel, even within the US Congress, might deter meaningful action to combat anti-Semitism? Let, let me take those as two different questions, Julie, if it's okay. Certainly. Because um, certainly uh, as a you know, born and raised Roman Catholic, I have struggled for all seven years to understand um, 
why anti-Semitism is so persistent, why it has been you know, the, led to the vilest crimes against humanity imaginable. Um, it, it just, this, this man's inhumanity to man that is part of anti-Semitism, I just, I just don't understand it. I'm reading a, a fascinating book by a black professor at American University now, uh, Ibram Kendi, uh, stamped from the beginning about the history of racist ideas in the United States. And he has a really interesting premise that, that what, what comes first is the economic or the cultural gain from repressing a good a cer certain people, you know, slavery in this case, which then leads to justification because doesn't always want to feel bad about ourselves, which then leads to racist ideas. And you, I think we've seen, that may not explain all anti-Semitism, but certainly a subset. Um, that if you look at uh, Jews in Germany in the 1930s who were prominent in so many ways, uh, intellectually, business and things like that, the economic threat generates the, the racist ideas to... Um, so the notion from Kendi and others is that we, that we promulgate anti-racist. So I would love to, on the parallel side, to find the, the pro-Semitic, um, you know, the anti-anti-Semitic, um, a set of, of policies, attitudes, cultures that we can move forward. Um, and on, on the issue of, of Israel, it's, it's always tough because um, you want to be able to segregate criticism of Israeli politics mm -hmm. from, uh, from any hatred or, or anti-Semitic behavior. It's not always easy to do and, and people confuse them some intentionally, some unintentionally. Um, and I, I think we just have to keep the dialogue as open as possible. Um, I, I would personally, and Pete and I probably differ on this, I'd rather see different um, Israeli leaders right now. Um, but that doesn't in any way diminish my support for Israel in the short run and the long run. A vital ally with democratic traditions and values and good friends forever. Kind of like you said before, we have to, to call it like we see it and count things. We have to sort of count anti-Semitism in one category and anti-Israel in another. Um, and then and our problem is to, if I may interrupt, it out. I'm sorry, our problem is to, many people in the world tie anti-Semitism to the Holocaust. And the Holocaust gave us a nation state of Israel. And so for them, there's a connection between anti-Semitism and Israel. But as Don mentioned, that is not true. Yes, it's a Jewish state, but it's a Jewish state. It's so nation. Anti-Semitism is not against the nation of Israel. It's against the Jewish faith. Big difference. But it's a real problem. As Don mentioned, you talk about anti-Semitism here in America. No, no, no. We have Israel, Palestinians. Oh, let's slow down here. Take some time. We have to just persist, 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 because we're all boss, Phil Graham, loved Israel, loved the Jewish people, said it best this way. Facts are little persistent things. If you have the facts on your side, you win the battle. It may not be tomorrow, next week, next year, but keep giving people the facts, talking to their hearts, they'll change. And that's our mission, with this bill starting out and further going forward. It's Julie, by the yes. way, Oh, yes, go ahead. Just, just, I also want to make that one more distinction, too, is um, I think we all, uh, in a bipartisan way, need to fight the anti-Israel opinion. There shouldn't be an anti-Israel. We can be critical of Israeli political decisions, just as we are critical of American policy decisions. You know, Pete and his friends were very critical of a lot of stuff that President Obama did. My pals and I have been critical of some of the things President Trump has done. But that doesn't mean we don't love our country. Um, and aren't, aren't, you know, in fact, uh, I would argue if, if I'm critical of a given decision that Prime Minister Netanyahu makes, it's because I love Israel and want it to be better and stronger. 
It's a great point. I mentioned our Muslim Jewish Advisory Council earlier and their support for no hate. And as you both know, this network of hundreds of civil society leaders was founded really as a response to the polarizing political discourse in this country in which Muslims and Jews both felt like their identities were being instrumentalized by, by some elements in both parties. So I want to ask you specifically, what can members of Congress do and then party leaders on both sides of the aisle, um, what can they do to make sure that there's no group that becomes a political football or no group's interests that become political footballs, especially during really heightened political election seasons like the one we're in now? Um, Congressman Olson, maybe you can answer that first. Well, the big thing, like for example, our press conference that Randy did such good set up such good job. We had the AGC there, obviously. We had the NAACP was there. We had people from the Muslim groups were there. We had people from the LBGTB, the crowd there. We had them all. The point is, this is not just anti-Semitism. It's not anti one ethnic group or one faith like Muslims. It's a hate crime against. And so we have to keep that message out that this is a hate crime. Don't cover it up. Don't try to hide it. As Don said, step up to the plate and say, this happened in my town, my county, my state. It'll never happen again. What can I do to stop this? And we've got the answer. And Julie, let me offer what may be a subtle or even confusing coming from me perspective on the political football. I think our society is best served and our parties are best served when they represent a broad cross-section of America. Um, I would love, you know, we have, I think all but two of the Jewish members of Congress of the House are Democrats. I'd love to see more Jewish Republicans. Um, Me and too. More, and more Muslim Republicans and more women Republicans. You know, that sometimes Democrats get painted as the party of the special interest. I, I, I hope not, but we are very diverse and the more diverse the Republican Party gets, I think the better we work together. And, and I don't, I would hate to see any given group, especially our, our American Jewish population as a political football. Amen. And also Don, that comes to my heart because Don knows what's the most diverse county in America? Fort Bend County, Texas. With the census that will happen uh, this year, we expect it to be divided equally between Caucasians, African-Americans, Hispanics, and Asians. And if you want to have a faith here, whatever faith you want to practice, come on down to Fort Bend County. We got mosques, we got temples, we got synagogues, we got Hindu temples, all of it. And oh, some Christian churches as well. Do we need that diversity to have this kind of heightened awareness of hate crimes? Like, Congressman Olson, is your support for this bill because you've seen the, the animosity towards some of these minorities? And does it make it a harder argument for parts of America that simply don't have that degree of diversity? I think it does, but they, that's, whole, that's that whole denial attitude. It doesn't happen here. It's a hate crime. Y'all probably don't remember, but the most horrific hate crime in Texas in my life happened about 15 years ago in Jasper, Texas. African-American veteran, was walking down the street. He was kind of licking up, his name was James Bird, to white supremacist pass in a pickup truck. Thought, what's the fun with this man? Well, because his skin color is black, they chained him to the back of their truck, drug him down this road for two miles. The first responders went there, the cops, the emergency management people started just they were repulsed because there was body parts, legs, arms, a trail of blood. Those guys went to prison. They got the death penalty. But my point is that happened in a small town in Texas. Something not quite that bad happens every single day in small towns across America. And our job is to make sure that people know this. And this bill says, hey, small town, don't be afraid to admit this happened. Jasper, Texas, staying now with James Byrd forever, and they did nothing wrong. We need to make sure that when it happens again, and it will, hopefully this will stop it. Step up, stand up, be heard, say it happened, help us out. Congressman Byer, we keep talking about this, this courage, but I want to ask you, 
we're a hundred percent behind this carrot effort, of course, to incentivize and promote reporting. But can you tell our audience what the barriers are to simply mandating reporting so that it doesn't rely on the, this courage to step up to report? Part, part of the, well, the, the biggest part of the problem there is uh, the U.S. Constitution, that the, unless we can um, phrase it as a national emergency, um, the power that Pete and I have and our colleagues is the power of the purse. <clears throat> so what we've done in this bill is to put uh, money on the table. It, when we were talking about the stick in the last Congress, we were taking money away. Uh, again, it was still, still had to do with uh, federal funding. So by putting uh, all the resources we have in this bill out there, I think we'll get a lot more people to, to be part of it. I want to just toss one small thing into <clears throat> and what Pete's talked about with the hate crimes. I'm from Virginia, and we're obviously, um, you know, we were the cap both capitals of the Confederacy, and um, slavery started there. And um, but one of the years ago in the 1980s, I was on the Virginia Israel Commission that Governor Palauz has started, and I was on the Education Committee. And one of the things we discovered going all around the state was that in much of the state, children had never heard of the Holocaust, and when you put it in the curriculum, they didn't believe it. Um, it was so alien from their experience and their upbringing. And if you don't teach people about the history of anti-Semitism and educate them, you're, it's much more difficult to bring them forward, to put them in the right enlightened place, to be pro-Semitic. It's a really good point. I know the, the House passed the, the Never Again Holocaust Education Act. Um, and then it's been passed by the Senate and signed into law. Um, hopefully the same trajectory that we'll see for the No Hate Act. Um, but you're right that it does sort of go hand in hand that we need an educated populace um, if we're actually going to prevent these crimes rather than simply counting them after they, after they occur. Julie, can I add one thing too? Because if we look at how does this become law? So we, we passed it in the House as part of the HEROES Act, which was you know, coronavirus part four, part five. Um, and it's a very expensive bill. It's a $3 trillion bill. Um, and I want to talk about all the things it does for state and local government, unemployment insurance. Um, I think the White House and Ms. McConnell have a, a more modest version of, a, of another stimulus. So ultimately, it's going to be a, a negotiation among Nancy Pelosi, Mitch McConnell, Chuck Schumer, and probably Steve Mnuchin on, on behalf of the White House. So anything that we can do, AJC can do with those particular players, with Speaker Pelosi, with Mitch McConnell, to say, whatever you do, keep the No Hate Act in the final bill. Um, it, it's, it's not the expensive part of the bill. It's not the part that the White House is gonna to object to. Um, that they're gonna be the players. Congressman Olson, do you have any other marching orders for us? Just get out and spread the word. As Don mentioned, this bill is not controversial. Democrat, Republican, Green Party, Tea Party, this bill is a good bill. Our challenge is to find a way to get passed into law. As Don mentioned, we have to focus. It's passed the House. It'll pass again if it comes up with another bill. The focus should be on the set. My job, our job, if you have a Republican senator in your state, as was mentioned, go and talk to him or her. How come, what's going on behind the scenes? Why won't Republican, like I did, step up and do the right thing? I'll talk to people I know and get that, because once we get that little spark going, that'll become a raging fire, a fire of final passes. The No Hate Act becomes law. Right behind me, HR 3545. Couldn't agree more. In a moment, I'm going to turn to the audience for questions. But before I do, um, Congressman Olson, on behalf of AJC, and especially AJC Houston and Randy Sarlinski, I want to offer a heartfelt thank you to you. Um, before you retire at the end of this Congress, um, oh, thank you. you have been a friend and a partner on this issue and so many others. And we will miss your steady, pragmatic policymaking. Um, I also have a question. You're not the only Texan who's retiring. Some are calling it a, a Texodus. What's the dynamic and what should we expect in the next congressional session? 
oh boy, we're seven current members of Texas are going home on my side now. That's seven out of 24. Myself, Bill Flores, oh, let's see, Mac Thornberry, Michael Conaway, Kenny Marchage, Will Hurd, and there's probably a, a but the people running here are good people. I, they're not talking, my district, they're not talking about more issues with anti-Semitism right now. They're focused on like human trafficking, other local issues to Texas. But once we get nominees, I'm gonna reach out to even the Democrat. Hey, I'm a nonpartisan now, baby, I'm leaving office. Okay, there'll be Sri Kalpani ran against me or maybe Troy Dallas or Kathleen Wall, Kathleen Troy. Great for your campaign. Come out and support this bill. It's a no-brainer. And if you go to Congress, get this thing done. But that doesn't matter because Don, I'll do it before then. They can get some other bill done to make it even better. Thank you. Well, I love your commitment. Facts and little <laughs> persistent things. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Jillian, I'll turn to you for questions. Thank you, Julie. We're getting a lot of questions from our live audience. Um, our first question comes from Lillian Fox in San Antonio, Texas, who says, the political and social conversation around the country shows a lot of mistrust in the law enforcement community. How do we make sure that victims of hate crimes, especially immigrants and other minorities, feel comfortable in reporting hate crimes to law enforcement? Um, Congressman Beyer, we can start with you. Well, um, and, and Pete may, may disagree with me, but I, I love the Justice and Policing Act that the House passed about two weeks ago. Uh, I know it will be compromised, you know, there'll be a compromised version that comes out of the Senate. And that's okay, because that's the way, way politics works. But by, by improving the public's trust in police, by getting rid of chokeholds or no-knock searches or um, you, the, you know, qualified immunity, things like that, um, yeah, these are reasonable policy debates, but I, I think all these will, will move us in a direction where um, we trust our police more. And I also think that anything we can do, jurisdiction by jurisdiction, to raise the caliber of the individual that we attract. For example, in my jurisdiction, every police officer is required to have a four-year college degree. And um, so you're getting um, not people who can't find a job uh, anywhere else, but rather people who really want to make serving the public, protecting the public, their life's work is going to help us a great deal. And follow up on Don's comments too, we have to somehow change the culture of see it, don't say anything. You know, we saw George Floyd be killed in Minneapolis, all horrified by that. He's being restrained because he wrote a bad check. That's not lethal force. He pulled no gun. He wasn't violent. But apparently this, this cop who gave the chokehold, they worked together, had some personal beef, and this guy killed this man. Nine minutes on his neck, he said, trying to say, I can't breathe. Three cops watched that happen. That's crazy. How come one cop, I know the rookies, but say, stop, stop, stop. We have to somehow change that culture of just being compliant because you're junior, you're young, you don't know what's going on. My Navy did that in the 1970s. As Don knows, we had real lots of bad safety issues. People dying because not by procedures. The Navy said, guys, going forward, every person on this ship is a safety officer. It's uh, loose. Seaman recruits Schmuckatelli, he's been a ship for one day, see something he thinks is wrong, he has a duty to speak up and tell the chain of command, this is wrong. They have a duty to tell him why it's not wrong or why, thank you for finding out, and no retributions. Say it, say it, say it. We had someone change that attitude because it's scary. I mean, Don's right, chokeholds should be barred. We should have also no more racial profiling. I've got a great friend in the Navy. I've never understood, being a white American, how interactions with local police officers is scary for African Americans and people of color. My buddy's a two-star admiral. He's not some chump, he's a star. He was pulled over in Beverly Hills about 10 years ago because he was a black man in a nice car in a 
Caucasian. They, that's racial profiling, pure and simple, and that has to stop. Again, if we encourage the entire community to have a change of attitude, see it, speak up. We can make a big difference. And, and Julie, one additional thing for Lillian, <clears throat> you know, there's a huge move now to body cameras for every police officer. We have a bill in, in Congress now to require body cameras for all federal officers. Uh, two of the jurisdictions I represent have made that move since uh, the George Floyd incident. And when you do that, not only does it protect the police from frivolous or unfair complaints against them, but it makes the, the, the citizen feel, look, this is, this is gonna be public record and they're gonna treat me better. And one more comment for Lillian. Lillian, don't be fooled. The Rockets will beat the Spurs at the NBA playoffs. <laughs> Thank you both for sharing that. Um, our next question is related to law enforcement as well. And as a follow up, um, Mark Stewart in Richmond, Virginia asks, when the current discussion surrounding police reform and funding cuts are happening in the US, Local, that local communities will face as a result of COVID, how else can Congress make sure that the law enforcement community does not lose its critical resources, such as for hate crime units or the units that help track hate crime statistics? Well, let me, let me just jump in. There's a reason that the House version was called the HEROES Act, because the, the first trillion dollars in there is for state and local governments. It's uh, the, the, the National Governors Association led by Republican Governor Larry Hogan of Maryland estimates state and local governments will be 550 billion short this year. So this is a two year effort for us because it's state and local governments that pay the police, the firefighters, the nurses, the teachers, the child protective service workers, the people that pick up the trash, the people that make our communities whole. And, and I'm, I am pretty confident that the negotiation that Speaker Pelosi will do with Leader McConnell um, will make sure that there is a lot of money for local government so that we don't do that. You know, we don't want to defund um, the police initiatives in our communities. And I think, I don't know whether Pete agrees with me, I don't think we need grenade launchers and tanks, um, the militarization of police, but we do need to make sure that they're properly funded so they can do their job protecting us. Amen. Also, too, some big things happen to hear back home with this regard. I mean, our local sheriffs and local police chiefs are making sure they get out in the community. They don't drive their cars, just cruise the neighborhood. They get out and knock on doors, get more interactive. That's voluntary, but still that's a big step to take away the fear. Because again, my buddy Gary got pulled over as a black man in a white neighborhood just because he's black. He's a two-star admiral, he's an American hero for somehow that racial profiling has to stop. And uh, I just, you know, this happened, Don probably knew this, I'm not as smart as he is, but I was stunned. Every African-American family, minority family of color here has what's called the talk as people start driving themselves. And that is, if you're pulled over, don't you dare move. Put your hands on the steering wheel, just sit there and wait for the police officer to come and do their job. I've never felt that. In fact, I bothered that. I got pulled over about a year ago because my wife's car dotted. It's not one of your cars because for some reason you turn off the back lights. Who wants those lights off? I don't know why criminals, but still our lights weren't on. We got pulled over for, I don't know why, the speed limit. I reached over to get my license before the cop came up. He came up and said, sir, don't you dare move until I, I say reach over to the glove compartment, I unleashed my, I unleashed my pistol. The point is, I didn't think about it. African Americans, people of color, lock their hands down in fear because a law enforcement person is gonna interact with them. I've never felt that, and that's gotta change. And that starts locally. It started right here, I did mention, our, our police chief did not know about the No Hate Act. And what he found out, he said, why has, man, I'm all over this, this is crazy. And that was Randy Sarlinski, man. He got that happening. Sugarland, Texas. <laughs> Julie, you, I, have to, I got pulled over a couple of years ago riding with my father. My father was an old NASCAR racer. And uh, so he had a black on black with tinted windows, hot rod of some kind. I don't know, Chevy Malibu, whatever. I was driving. It was nighttime. 
And uh, the cop pulled us over. Once I rolled the window down, uh, he just said, okay, and walked away. <laughs> but it was the, the car itself was the target. While we're talking about cars, and because you made that self-deprecating comment, I want to say that my father-in-law is a repeat buyer of Don Buyer Volvos, and the wheels never fall off. And I, lights I, always I, I knew you came from a good family. <laughs> <laughs> Jillian, back to you. Thank you. Our next question comes from Shrub Kempner, who's an AJC Board of Governors member from Galveston, Texas. I mean, a lot of our viewers have been writing in about the working definition of anti-Semitism. So I'll try and combine a few. Um, the working definition of anti-Semitism sometimes runs into partisan conflicts when it comes to free speech issues, um, when all it does is provide some clear guidelines for what anti-Semitism is, and when comments that are anti-Israel cross the line into anti-Semitism. Um, the question is, what are both of your thoughts on the working definition of anti-Semitism and what can Congress do? Um, we can start with uh, Representative Olson. Great question, especially from Galveston, Texas. Oh, by the way, that's a very special town in terms of our civil liberties. That was a town that started Juneteenth in uh, 1865. It took the slaves in Texas three months to find out the war was over, the slaves were free. The Emancipation Proclamation was read in Galveston, Texas. And that is Juneteenth. Now, to answer your question, gotta plug my home state, obviously. Um, it's, it's a tough deal. Anti-Semitism, we have to define it for sure. We can't just leave it left to the courts because that just, courts come and go to get more liberal, more conservative, something's happened. And that's a job, Don, I know we took an oath of the Constitution. We write the laws. The wording should be worded that it reflects what anti-Semitism is. We can't cover this up with some sort of blanket. It's evil. It's heinous. If the words say that, I don't care. It needs to say what it is, no BS. I'm happy to take inputs because that's a big, big issue because how can we find anti-Semitism if we can't define it? Define it first, find it second. Great question from Galveston, Texas. Oh, by the way, Galveston, I got on to San Antonio. My Clay Falcons kicked the heck out of Galveston ball and basketball in 1981. Bye-bye, Taurus. Thank you, <laughs> Representative Byer. Well, um, I, I can't compete with Pete's amazing Galveston stories, although wasn't that a mighty storm is one of my favorite folk songs. Um, I, you know, I confess, I don't know what the formal or working definition of anti-Semitism is. So I, I'd love to, to see it. I'm sure it's way more sophisticated and understanding than anything that I would put together. But I think a, a step forward and I'm, I'm assuming, I may make a leap of faith that there is a widely accepted working definition of anti-Semitism. Um, that if I don't know it, and I couldn't repeat it back, and maybe Pete can't either, it might make sense to try to do a, a congressional resolution that puts it in writing that we try to pass, you know, by unanimous consent in the House, um, that just puts it, you know, for once and for all in the congressional record. Congressman Byer, you are speaking to um, the heart of Shrub Kempner from Galveston, Texas, who, who asked that question. And um, I'm happy to tell you a little bit on one foot in 12 seconds what the working definition is. Um, it's a definition that was passed by the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance um, and adopted by nearly 20 more or less countries um, around the world, um, utilized by our State Department, our Department of Education, um, and other various institutions. Um, and it basically goes through the, the complicating factors of anti-Semitism because it can come from multiple sources, because it can um, be guised as anti-Israel criticism um, and really lay out in a way that makes it easy for, because we're talking about law enforcement here, law enforcement and others to say, now we understand why that incident actually was an anti-Semitic incident. So um, with your permission, I will schedule a follow-up conversation with you to talk about that. Um, and hopefully we can make some, uh, some meaningful movement on, on getting Congress's attention raised about the, the importance of the working definition. Jillian. 
Thank you. Um, our next question comes from Patricia Fay in Detroit, who says, I had a larger question on hate in general. Hate crimes don't exist in a vacuum. What else can be done about some of the anti-Semitic and racist rhetoric that is on the rise in America? Um, Congressman Byer, we can start with you this time. Uh, I'm sorry, my, 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 my wife was talking over my shoulder. So <laughs> no worries. Um, so the question is from Patricia Fay in Detroit, who has a larger question on hate in general. She says, hate crimes don't exist in a vacuum. What else could be done about some of the anti-Semitic and racist rhetoric that is on the rise in America? Um, I have tried not to be too partisan on this call. Um, and so if Pete will forgive me, um, I think we need as many leaders as possible who are healers, who lift everyone up, who don't try to pit one group against another group. We talk about the fact that we're, we're all Americans, we're all human beings. Um, there are lots of subsets in there um, that the income inequality in America is a, is a terribly divisive thing. The differential access to health care, the differential access to education. One of the things we're seeing is widely differential access to, to broadband, which is very relevant in, in the COVID world. Um, not all these are, are going to affect, you know, different discriminated, discriminated groups, you know, um, but the notion of leaders that are healing and bringing people together and lifting everybody up, I think that is unifying. Thank Amen. You. And also, our documents say, we the people. The people have the duty right now. We got to give them encouragement. No way that does that to see something and say something. Okay, don't go to corners because, wow. I might have seen a hate crime or heard of a hate crime. That's awful. It's horrific. But if I say something, I'll get drugged into this. Sorry. You saw it. You heard about it. Say something. Because you take that one first step, we may be able to stop future hate crimes. And that's the whole goal that I have this bill. That first little step into the deep ocean to stop hate crimes, stop anti-Semitism, anti-Muslim, whatever. Anti, 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 no, be the open, welcoming society we've always been. So support this bill, get this bill passed. That's the best thing to do right now. And then we'll go forward. Absolutely, thank you. Um, I think we have time for one final question before I turn it over to Julie. Um, so the last question comes from Dale Goldberg in Seattle, who asks, are there larger lessons on bipartisanship that can be learned from the two of you working together on this crucial piece of legislation? Congressman Olson, we can start with you this time. It's simple. You see how it works. I mean, Don and I have spoken. We said some things I disagree with that he said. He disagrees with things I said, but we're still smiling, laughing, and going forward. And that's stuff that our parties have to work upon. It's gotten so divisive. Both parties are pulled by their extremes. The extreme left for my Democrat friends, the extreme right for my friends, my party. And that's got to stop. I keep bringing up Phil Graham. One great example of how things have changed in D.C. It's 1999. He's down on the floor going off on some bill. It's terrible. Unconstitutional, kills American jobs, sends jobs overseas. In comes Robert Byrd, liberal Democrat from Dodd's neighbor state, West Virginia, the dean of the Senate. He disagrees with Phil. They go out with words for a good 15 minutes, just back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. It's all over. Phil beelines it to Robert. I'm like, oh gosh, here comes confrontation. Phil puts his arm around him, getting that George accent and says, my friend, that is a heck of a lot of fun. Thank you, I enjoyed that thoroughly. When I said that, that, that was a beautiful counter punch. Oh, my dear friend Phil, my dear friend Phil. That's gone. If that debate happened today, it's sad to say, and Don and I haven't done it, but some people in our parties, both parties would say, you're stupid, you hate America. No one in Congress hates America, no one. Yes, we differ on our future, what's good for it, but we don't hate her. We gotta stop, no hate there. I mean, again, it's awful. But we're a reflection of the people. The people have to step up and say, listen, we won't tolerate this behavior. We want like Don Byron Pete Olson. Don't 
Yeah, like that looks like a UT longhorn, some some little cow thing a steer, but I know it's not that. I see him over your right, your left ear there, Don. But yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I, um, Dale, I've thought and worried a lot about the the partisan nature because it's not an unfriendly place. Um, I, I have many many friends among the Republicans, although we vote differently, and it's often difficult to get together on a piece of legislation. One of the things that drives that is that we now have um, single member districts with plurality voting. And there's a political science log, um, Duverger's principle that says that will inevitably lead to highly part partisan two, two party system. And, and as, as Pete knows, when he runs in a Republican district, the one who's farthest on the right tends to win the primary. And in my seat, everyone runs to the left to get the, so you come to Congress with this huge gap, um, not much overlap. If for the, for the political junkies among you, go to HR 4000, it's the Fair Representation Act, which we've been pushing for about six years that would move us to rank choice voting with multi-member districts. And what that then means would be that people would be running for the center rather than for the extremes. You'd have a lot more centrist Democrats and centrist Republicans, center left, center right, rather than the extremes that we so often see expressed today. And even if you're not extreme in, in today's world, unless you tend to vote with the extreme, you get pilloried by the people at the extremes. For Pete to vote for a common sense gun measure, for example, or for me to vote for something that would seem to be a common sense Republican measure, we would take enormous amounts of heat from the more extreme parts of our party. And so we often don't. That's sad, but that's fact. I mean, Don's right. Tough vote for me on gun control, tough vote for Don. Drilling offshore, Virginia. Okay, that's a tough vote. But we have to have, again, we're an example right here of how this can work. I mean, Don and I didn't know each other until a couple years ago. I knew of him living in Virginia. Don Byer, Don Byer, got a car there, Volvo, but it's shown that, you know, listen, we're very different. Different solutions to problems, but we can come together and not pillarize the other because he's different or she's different. And that's what's got to stop. And that takes Congress and the people to say enough is enough. I want to thank you both for sharing your time with us and for modeling such effective bipartisanship um, in this effort to protect the Jewish community and other vulnerable communities, uh, but really in everything that you've said. It's something that I wish, frankly, we were hearing from more members of Congress, and I hope that AJC can be a vehicle for getting that message of bipartisanship out um, to Congress and to other elected officials. I know there were a number of questions in, in the chat about uh, what to do and how can people who are watching this and are motivated and inspired by your words, um, what can they do to help promote the No Hate Act? So it, for everyone who's in front of a computer, I ask you to please go to AJC.org slash take action and you will see right away our action alert um, allowing you to write to both your representatives and your senators in support of the no hate act um hr 3545 in the house um and if you want to do more if you want to be more involved in this advocacy effort or other ajc advocacy efforts um please reach out to me um julie raymond my email is raymond r-a-y-m-a-n uh, J at AJC.org. It would be a pleasure to advocate with you. Uh, Jillian, with that, um, I will thank the members of Congress one more time and turn to you for, for final words. Thank you all for such an important and, and timely conversation. And I also want to thank our audience for joining us and for showing your commitment to the topics discussed here today. At a time of rising fear and uncertainty with hateful rhetoric on the rise, we cannot allow crimes motivated by hatred to go unchecked and uncounted. Please visit AJC.org slash take action, as Julie mentioned, to learn more. Um, in these unique times, while, while so many of us are separated from our family and friends, AJC is still bringing us together on the issues that matter. Please consider making a donation to AJC so we can offer you more programs like this one. Um, please visit AJC.org slash donate. Our next Advocacy Anywhere program will feature a conversation with Mark Melman renowned political strategist, pollster, and president and CEO of the Democratic Majority for Israel. 
for an assessment of political trends and tensions within both the Jewish community and the Democratic Party. This program will take place on Tuesday, July 14th at 12 p.m. Eastern time. I hope you'll join us. Um, please stay safe and healthy. Shabbat Shalom and thank you everyone. Shalom. Shalom. Thank you.